God had sent his angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to Mary, a virgin who was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But Mary was greatly troubled and afraid at his words. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. And that night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. When suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, I bring you good news. That will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, and you will recognize him by this time. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. The shepherds hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby, lying in a manger. It was just as the angel had told them. He had come, Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel. So that story you just saw, what you just heard, uh, that's arguably the most told, retold story of the last 2,000 years. In fact, there are pastors just like me all over the country, all around the world, who are taking this story tonight, and they're trying to capture the hearts and the minds of their congregation, capture their hearts and their minds around a story that is actually historically accurate, that this is a story that actually has life-changing implications. And then tomorrow, tomorrow we're probably going to have parents with their kids, maybe before, maybe after, unwrapping their gifts, where they'll sit down and they'll actually take God's word and they'll open up the pages of God's word and they'll read this story with the hope that those kids will understand this life-changing reality that hopefully these parents have experienced. And tonight, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this story and I'd like to dig a little bit deeper, maybe past some of the nostalgia, uh, maybe past some of the cultural norm that tonight and tomorrow are. I mean, let's be honest, uh, how many of you have been a part of a Christmas Eve service before? Yeah, the vast majority of us, right? And some of you, it's not Christmas until you have this experience, until you have that candle and you get to light it, and then, oh, okay, now it's finally, we can celebrate Christmas. And we've been celebrating Christmas since, you know, we were born. That's just something that we expect to do. It's just one of those cultural things that we do. But locked away in these cultural norms and the nostalgia, again, is this life-saving, changing story. It changes our lives. It changes the world around us. And so we're going to dig deep into that tonight. We're going to look at some aspects of the story that hopefully, hopefully we don't miss. Because in the, in the pursuit of all these really good things around Christmas, it's just so easy to miss them. So if you have your Bibles, if you want, um, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to be spending our time tonight. I'm not going to read a whole lot from Luke, only because you just heard the entire Christmas story right there in the video. But I do want to highlight just a few verses. Let's start in verse 8. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. So this first reality in this story that, that's really just life-changing is the fact that, that God's good news actually just pushes out and moves our fear aside. 
And, and I don't know if you've ever played the game. Have you ever played the game where someone asks you, hey, if you could ask God any question, what would you ask him? Or, or maybe you've just internalized that question for yourself and you thought, man, when I die and I get to heaven, I am definitely going to ask God this question. Anyone ever play that game before? Isn't it interesting, though, in Scripture that whenever someone comes in contact with an angel or some aspect of the divine, like, they don't take advantage of that opportunity. Like, none of them are like, oh, hey, I've got a question. Angel, finally, I, I've got this question. Can God, can he make a boulder so heavy that even he can't lift it? You know, because he can create anything, right? But, but, you know, he's all powerful. So is that, like, no one asks these types of questions. Instead, what do we see? We constantly see, like, this fear, this, this concern. We even see it with Mary earlier. Joseph's a little disturbed when he wakes up from the dream, right? This is what happens when we encounter the divine, and this is what's happening actually with the shepherds. They're terrified. Now, good news for the shepherd, this angel is not there to kill the shepherds. Uh, instead, he's bringing actually good news, good news of great joy. Good news that's actually um, on a micro level, we see what is God doing? God is actually doing something that he does on a macro level in all of our lives if we allow him to do it. See, all of us have fears, don't we? But what does God do? He promises that he actually will move those fears aside and his glory and his power can take care of any fears that we struggle with. Now, I know that sounds really churchy and some of you are like, yeah, that's just what you know, people say at church. But my fears, they're bigger. They're bigger than uh, you know, this God thing that you talk about. Now, I, I get it on an intellectual level, but I've never experienced that. I've always still struggled with my fears. I've always struggled with my insecurities, my worries. Like, does that really work? Let me talk to you about, uh, just kind of unravel this a little bit, because I think it, this is definitely a reality we can walk in, that we can walk in confidence, we can walk in faith every single day of our lives. And it's because of the reality of who God is and this good news that he's brought on Christmas Day. Well, how does this work? It starts within your head, and then it can move into your heart, and then it becomes the pattern and rhythm of your life. I'm going to walk you through kind of an exercise for just a moment, so, so bear with me. First of all, I want you to think of just something that you're afraid of. I want you to think about some fears that you experience on a regular basis. Maybe it's fears that you don't really talk about. Uh, maybe it's those things that keep you up at night, though. These are those moments where you recognize, you know, I have some real shortcomings in life, and I don't know if I'm ever going to measure up. These are the things that keep you up at night and think, you know what, maybe at some point people are going to discover I'm a total fraud and I've known it all along and then finally they're going to know it. Or, or maybe it's those fears of how am I going to make the payments this month. Maybe it's the fears of what if God takes this person from my life. If this person is taken from my life, I don't know if I could go on. And, and there's just that deep fear of losing a loved one. Whatever the fear is, I just want you guys to kind of internalize that for a moment. And now what I want you to do is... Just do a little exercise where you can, in your own mind's eye, just kind of take yourself outside of our planet. So you're hanging out in space and you're looking at our planet. Huge, right? You look into the, uh, the seas, you see the oceans, you see all of the different land masses right there in the planet. You got seven billion people, over seven billion people, all with their worries and their fears. Now I want you to go a little bit further back. Maybe, maybe include some of the planets. Like you went past Jupiter, it's got that big, you know, orange brown spot. You guys know what that brown spot is, right? It's, it's actually a huge storm. And inside that huge storm, you can actually fit three of our Earths in it. Like that's how big that storm is. So go a little bit further out. Maybe include the whole sol solar system. You've, you've got the sun, you've got uh, a little Pluto out there. Go a little bit further now. And include all of the Milky Way galaxy. Go a little bit further out and include other galaxies. Go as far out as you can to the very edge of the universe. Who's still above all of those things? God is still over all of those things, created and still in control of all of those things. Now put that in perspective. So God is above everything, including your fears, including those, including those 7 billion people on this tiny little blue speck hanging out there in the universe. And God says, I've come to bring good news to you. And so on a micro level, these, these shepherds, they're really frightened, right? And what does God do? You know, he pushes the fear aside. I've got good news for you. But see, the good news continues into our li lives on a macro level as followers of him. See, the good news is that this God, who is above everything, actually came in the form of Jesus, walked and lived that perfect sinless life, died on the cross, rose three days later, conquering sin and death. 
and actually conquering the fear that exists in your life. And beyond that, this God actually wants to reside in our hearts and our souls. So imagine that, this God who is all-powerful resides in your very heart and your very soul. And so all those fears that, that creep into our hearts and our minds, well, then they simply become, if we recognize and remember who God is, well, they just become stuff that we can actually learn and grow and mature from. And maybe those fears no longer will have the grip on our hearts and our souls. What do we see in this Christmas story? On a micro level, what we see is that this good news has the ability to actually push out fear in our life. We see something else, too. We see that worship is actually prioritized correctly. Worship is prioritized. So in chapter 2, starting in verse 13, it says, Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So I just, I want you to picture this. So if, imagine that you were one of these shepherds, and your heart rate had just kind of gotten to a, a steady beat um, because the angel showed up and you got freaked out, and you thought maybe you were going to die. And then, um, then you start realizing, okay, this is good news. And then right when things are pretty solid, uh, well, that's when the heavens, like, rip open, and we've got this choir of angels, and you've got this bright light, and you've got all this singing, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Now, is this where death is going to come? I, got the, I thought it was good news. Like, that's what they're experiencing. But then they start hearing this music. And I, I'm guessing that this is, like, the sweetest music that they've ever heard in their entire lives. And as they start to listen, they start to realize, okay, what are they saying? What are these angels singing? We're singing, glory, glory to God in the highest. In this moment, worship is prioritized correctly. Here's what I mean by this. So tomorrow, I think most of us, there's going to come a time, maybe it's going to be late afternoon, maybe early evening, and there's going to be this moment where you're just going to feel something, and you're not going to really like what you feel. It's going to feel a lot like disappointment. Even if your Christmas was perfect, kids decided not to wake up super early, so you got, you got a little extra sleep. Kids, you got everything you wanted for Christmas, all the video games, the bike, the basketball hoop. You got everything you wanted. Your, your family came over, and somehow, like your mother-in-law, well, she didn't have one word of criticism. Like Christmas miracle, right? Like that's the Christmas that you experience. There's still going to be this moment, though, where you're like, oh, okay, so there was weeks and weeks of buildup to Christmas, and it's over? Man, it's, it, it's done. I have to wait a whole other year? Maybe you won't experience that tomorrow, but I know you've experienced that before. Like, why, 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 what's going on? Why do we feel that? Why do we experience this? Because all those good things, the gifts, the food, the family, all those good things, they're actually just a small echo of a greater reality that deserves our worship. That greater reality is God. And, and look at it this way. So my wife, I love my wife like crazy. She is the best person, hands down, the best person I've ever known. And we'll probably, well, outside of Jesus, the best person I've ever known. And, and she makes a fantastic wife, a, a wonderful partner in ministry. She is such a good mom. But you know what? For all the ways that she like meets, like needs in my life, she makes a terrible God because she can't meet the deepest needs in my heart and my soul. I love my job. Love my work. I love that I get a minister with you. And, and, and we get a, I get to actually get paid to take God's truth and hopefully deliver in engaging and life-impacting ways. That is so cool that I get to do that. I love it. But you know what? My job makes a terrible God. My kids, as much as I love them, they don't make the best God. Stuff, stuff makes a horrible God. But what do we do? What do we do? We actually take these things, like these gifts, and we take these times with family and having a meal, and what do we do? What we end up doing is we end up worshiping these things as, of the, as opposed to the one who really is deserving of our worship. You know, when the angels came, what did they sing? They sang, glory to those presents under the tree because they're so amazing. You know? <laughs> glory to that turkey, that ham that tastes so delicious. Oh, this is good stuff. Glory to family. Glory to family because nothing, nothing is better than family. How many, how many times have you ever heard people make some similar comment like that? Oh, nothing's better than family. Oh, it's all about family. Okay, you know, your family's great, but your family makes a terrible God. Honestly, you want to ruin your marriage? Like, tell your spouse to save you. 
She's not, he's not meant, designed to do that. He cannot do that. You want to ruin your relationship with your children? Ask them to continually validate you. That's not what they're supposed to do. You will ruin the relationship. Uh, you want to wreck retirement? Well, make your work your God. And on the day of retirement, you will have no purpose, significance anymore in life. You wrecked retirement. See, here's the thing. The angels sing properly, glory to God in the highest. And at Christmas time, sometimes we get our worship mixed up and it's not prioritized correctly. But what do we see here? Man, glory and honor and praise, it goes to God. And that's what we cannot miss. There's a third aspect of this Christmas story that I don't want to miss. And that is love replaces wrath and joy replaces shame. Love replaces wrath and joy replaces shame. And I think for us to understand this, I think we need to understand kind of the fact that this, this good news is being rolled out to who? It's being rolled out to shepherds. And I don't think most of us know any shepherds. You probably don't have like a best friend who's a shepherd. I know some of you just love being contrary. And so you're like, no, 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 no. I've got a really good friend down in Harrodsburg. He's got like five head of sheep. Man, I know some shepherds, right? Okay, good for you. The rest of us, let me give you some context. What's happening here? See, in the first century, shepherds, unlike your friend in Harrodsburg, they were despised. They were. Uh, these individuals, they were seen as dirty. They were seen as thieves. They were seen as scoundrels. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the Mishnah, but in Jewish tradition, they have this oral law. That Again, it was an oral law, but eventually they took the oral law and they wrote it down and they referred to it as the Mishnah. And so in the Mishnah, they actually have this line that talks about shepherds and how despised they were. Let me read to you a section. It says, shepherds are incompetent. No one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. Whoa, that's crazy. So just imagine, you're walking along on a hike with your friends, and you hear like this, help, help. Like, do you hear that? Yes, I hear that. Well, let's go investigate. And suddenly, you see this pit and there's jagged edges and there's there's an individual down there and he's got blood on him and he's bruised and you're like shepherd man this guy let's get out of here like who and who would do that but again because they're so despised like yeah yeah you can leave those guys they're dumb enough to fall in there in the first place yeah just leave them to that's crazy uh, there's another individual um, this guy's name is Jemias, and he actually was writing about the first century and the sixth century, and he talks about this issue of shepherds. This is what he says. He says, to buy wool, milk, or a kid, a baby lamb, baby, uh, baby goat, from a shepherd was forbidden on the assumption that it would have been stolen property. Don't even do dealings with shepherds. Don't even do business with shepherds. It's probably all stolen anyway. Shepherds were not allowed to actually hold a, a judicial office. Uh, they were not allowed to actually be a witness in a judicial trial. This is why, uh, this, is, this is because they were just seen as, again, scoundrels. Uh, they were seen as liars and thieves and dirty and gross. But when God decides to unroll this good news of great joy, who does he come to? Who does he bring it to? He brings it to the shepherds. What is God telling us in this moment? God is telling us, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. It doesn't matter how much wrath you think God should have on your life because of the poor choices in your past and maybe even your present and maybe in your future. There's good news. This good news is for you as well. And you may be walking with this shame and you may walk, walk with this guilt, but hey, you know what? There's joy. The joy is that all that is forgiven. What do we not want to miss this Christmas? As if you're dealing with fear, understand that this good news, that God is bigger and above all of it, and we can walk with confidence instead of fear. If you're struggling and, and you're just thinking, I'm, I'm just so disappointed with life, is it possible that maybe your worship needs to be reprioritized and you need to stop worshiping the created and you need to start worshiping the creator? You know, what do we not want to miss? If you're walking in shame and guilt and you just can't seem to get over certain mistakes in your life, guys, don't be branded. Don't be branded by that shame. Take that joy that he has forgiven you. He has paid the price that was ultimately meant for you. This is what we don't want to miss at Christmas. In December, at the very beginning of December, we, uh, 
we read a section of scripture that was from Isaiah. And I want to read it to you guys again. This is in Isaiah um, chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 2. It says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And one of the things that we challenge you guys to just kind of think through and process is that if you have been transformed by the light and the life of Christ, well, then how are you going to be just creative in bringing that same light and life to the world around you? And I loved it because you guys as a church, you jumped in and you said, yeah, I'm going to do this. And there was just so many cool stories that came out of it. But we want to share a couple of ways that you brought some light and life into pe uh, people's lives here at our church uh, through the Blessings Project. Uh, the Blessings Project was just a challenge for you guys to give $1.00. Maybe some of you decided to give more than $1, but at least $1. We asked you guys to give, and we were just going to see what God could do with it. Watch this video. I want to introduce you to a family, the Vincent family. They've actually been coming to our church for almost a year now. You probably recognize Mackenzie and little Levi. Uh, Levi actually came into this world last year, and whenever you've got a new baby, there's so much excitement, there's so much joy. But uh, Mackenzie and her husband also realized that children are expensive. You know, you've got the diapers and you've got all those other things that uh, kids have to have to have to survive. But on top of that, um, just the payment for a hospital stay, a hospital birth, is quite expensive. Now the Vincents weren't worried about that because they were paying into the insurance that was going to take care of all of that. And so it came as a great surprise that this year the hospital began to say that they actually did not get their payment from the insurance and now the Vincents were going to have to pay all of those fees. They went ahead and got some lawyers involved to try to make a case, but as oftentimes as these things go, they were denied. And unfortunately, now their wages each month are being garnished until those bills are paid. And so you can imagine the burden and the stress that this is causing to the family. And so we as a church thought we could step in and we could help alleviate some of that burden. Now Mackenzie does not know that she is going to be coming and receiving this gift, but we've just told her that we've got something that we want to give her. And so she's going to be showing up here and uh, we're going to see what happens and we're going to see how you guys and your generosity is going to make a big impact in this family's life. If you can go ahead and have a seat. So, okay. so Mackenzie is just coming from her class, and she was telling me that she dresses up for the kids. <laughs> and was this the last day of school? Uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Tomorrow's the drama day. Okay. <laughs> so, hey, it's better than the drama day. Yeah. So you're probably wondering, okay, what's up with the lights? What's up with the camera? Why is Josh looking so weird behind the camera? <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for coming in. If you... Um, know at the beginning of this month we challenged the church to just think creatively of how we can bring light and life to our community and one of the needs that we want to try to help meet is your need now we did not tell anyone what your need was in fact it was just a moment ago Josh and I were doing some filming and I shared your need about having Levi thinking that insurance is going to take care of it and not being able to uh, not be not having the insurance not to actually take care of it and now you're in the position of your wages getting garnished and wondering okay when is this going to end so we want to give you a little gift it's not going to meet all of the probably the, the bills that you have to pay but hopefully it will be at least a little bit of relief um, to you so I'm going to give you a check uh, for $500 help with these fees. So Merry Christmas on behalf of the church. We love you and hopefully this allows you just to experience a little bit of God's love this year. Thank you all so much. You have no idea how much that sorry. <laughs> you guys it's been rough uh, the last few months. So it's it's definitely a blessing and an unexpected one <laughs> at that. So I am we are very thankful. <laughs> no, I don't know what to do, I'm getting hot. <laughs> no, you're good. Well, it's probably the lights. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you for coming in, and you guys have a fantastic Christmas. Thank Love you me. all so much. Thank you. <laughs> At church, I'm hanging out here with Jennifer Gribbins, and you probably recognize her because she's been coming for a number of years with her boys. 
Uh, but it was about this time last year that in our life groups we were talking about sharing our testimony. And one of the things that you sent me was a testimony of a moment where God showed up in your life in a really big way. Uh, it was a number of years ago, and uh, it was it was February 2009, correct? Mm -hmm. And your son, Ms. Henley, who is now 15, was about three years old. Uh, if you were living here in the area in 2009, uh, you probably remember there was an ice storm. And so this, this ice storm actually had a big part to play in your testimony. Tell us what happened. You were, you were going to go to UK. You had a cousin who was going through surgery. You wanted to be supportive to your family. So your plan was to drive down there, and then something happened. Um, me and my best friend were stopping at my mom's to get something, and I can't even remember what it was. Um, and I was walking up the 12 driveway, and I slipped and fell. And it was um, like if anything, my legs were in the air, and my head crashed onto the blacktop. And um, I remember my friend laughed because she thought I was being silly. And I immediately saw the stars. And uh, we got up and we continued on. Now, at UK Hospital, you were in immense pain, mm -hmm. but you're trying to tough your way through it. At what point, though, did you realize, hey, things, things aren't quite right? It was a couple of weeks later. Um, I remember in the hospital, I sat with my head in my mom's lap and she just stroked it um, while my cousin was having surgery. And she asked me to go to the ER to get checked out. And I just thought it hit my head. It was no big deal. So uh, a couple weeks later, um, my vision started changing. And so at this point, like the vision isn't just you're seeing stars, you're actually losing your eyesight mm -hmm. uh, to the point where you were even in that job interview and the person interviewing you thought you might not be able to read because you couldn't even see properly I, to read. Yes, I actually got up and left that interview because I was so embarrassed that they thought I couldn't read that I just left it. And I know one of the things that really kind of really helped you was you ran into your military group and he had a, uh, his wife died recently and he was hearing your story and recognizing, okay, this is serious. If you used to be able to see just fine, you had an accident, and now you're losing your sight, you need to go to the eye center. And so you took his advice, even though you were still wanting to kind of tough it out. Uh, tell us what happened there. I was at the little, the roller deck thing where the reader glasses were. Okay. I was 24. I thought my age was getting to me, so I was getting me some readers. And um, he was upset about his wife, and he, he begged me to go to the eye center. So the little text went to the eye doctor and he came out. I did have Emily with me, who was in the shopping cart. And um, he said, I'm not touching you. He said, you need to go to the ER right now. And um, that scared me. And so when you're at the hospital, what did they discover? I mean, you had hit your head at this point, maybe like a month ago? Yeah, probably. And so what did they discover? Uh, they found a mask on my room, but their technology at that hospital, they didn't know what it was. And so at the time I got to the hospital, from being at Walmart, being to the first day of the hospital, I can no longer see anything but light. Wow. Yeah. And so what did the doctors tell you was that? Um, they said I needed to go to the UK hospital in Lexington and they transferred me to the ambulance. No, none of my family was allowed to go with me. And there, I'll never forget him, but he held my hand and he prayed for me the entire trip. This is the EMT? The EMT that was at the end of uh, Kate's prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then once you got to the hospital, the UK hospital, mm -hmm. they basically said you have two choices. What were the two choices? Well, that's where they found out it was a brain aneurysm, and we were tired of a long day. And they said, um, I had two choices that I had brain surgery. And if I did, I had 24% chance to live. If I did live, I would be a vegetable the rest of my life. And I would be gone. Or uh, not have surgery and not be a vegetable. Wow. So, neither choice is a good choice. And I assume at that point. Um, I immediately said surgery. And so after the surgery, you're not a vegetable. You can see 2020 vision at this point mm -hmm. in your life. And God came through in a big way. He came through uh, so big. They said if I made it through the surgery, the vegetable, never walk, never nothing. And I walked out of the hospital three days later. God is amazing. Amen. Well, Jen, we know that 
over the years, you know, things have not always been easy, but you've consistently come through for you and shown up in your life. And uh, talking with you a couple weeks ago, um, you were just sharing with me how this year's been kind of tough uh, in the sense that, you know, child support um, hasn't necessarily come in. Uh, you've drained through savings. You even had to find different ways of, of making money outside of your normal job, uh, find different, different employment from uh, on the weekends. And so uh, we wanted to let you know that we've seen those needs and we want to, on God's behalf, kind of show up again as a church. And so we've got some gifts for you um, at no, Christmas no. time. So uh, the first gift, the first gift that we have for what you. What are you doing? I'm going to play some the, the first gift is a $100 gift card no. to the grocery store. You want to stop taping? We're not going to stop taping. <laughs> Here you go, Jen. But we also know because you've got bills to pay and you were single mom. Oh, and you've got, and you've got, uh, you don't have savings out uh, these days. We also want to give you a check no. um, for three hundred dollars. So it's not huge, but no, three hundred dollars will help. So Jen, this is yours on behalf of the church. But it is Christmas time, and so we also wanted to give you some gifts. I thought uh, I looked like an ugly <laughs> No, you look great. So we've got we've got some gifts. This one is actually for McKinley. So you can enjoy this one. <laughs> and uh, these these two are for Jonah. And then we also have a gift here just for you. But we want to let you know, again, God sees you. God knows what you're going through. And uh, you can consistently come through for you. We love you. You are a fucking bitch. <laughs> that is so sweet. Church, that's just one way. Yeah, two ways that you guys have brought light and life into people's lives this December, and uh, just so proud of you. You know, what would, a, what would our lives look like if it wasn't for the light of Christ? We would all be in darkness. We would all be trying to grope around, trying to make sense of this world, and not making any sense at all. And one of the things that we do every single year is we light our candles, but there are, there's something significant about it, and the reason why we do this is because oftentimes when you're in a dark room, and I know we've got these lights, and so it's not a really dark room, but this would be enough to actually light up the room. But then when you just look at one light, you think, okay, yeah, but can it really actually, can it actually invade all the dark places and spaces of our world? And this is why Jesus says, you, know, you are also the light of the world. That once you've experienced my light in my life, you now have a responsibility to share that with others. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually walk down and I'm going to begin to light your candles. And you're going to see the impact of what that has on our little world here and what, on a symbolic level, what it can do in the world around us. 